Hello, everyone. Welcome to the uh, REXIS uh, 20 session, Fairness, Filter Bubbles, and Ethical Concerns. Hope you've been enjoying the conference so far. Uh, this is our uh, second run of this uh, particular session. Uh, so by now, you're familiar with uh, the format. We have several uh, presentations. Each speaker is presenting for about 10 minutes, and then we have a few minutes for Q and A. Um, and the questions are going to be uh, posted on uh, Whoa. So uh, please uh, post your questions there. Um, you will need to go to the uh, specific uh, page for uh, click on the title of the paper on who was uh, uh, on the list of uh, papers for the session to get the specific page for that particular paper. And then you can uh, type in your questions there. And we'll try to get to as many questions as we can. Uh, but uh, even if there are a lot of questions posted, please you know feel free to post your question and the uh, presenters or the authors at some point hopefully can respond to some of the questions that we can't get to. All right, so uh, without further ado, we are going to uh, uh, start the session. And the first paper is titled The Theoretical Modeling of the Iterative Properties of User Discovery in a Collaborative Filtering Recommender System. And Sami Hanisi is going to uh, be presenting. Uh, Sami, please take it away. Can you share the screen? Yeah. Okay, so, so is it working now? Yep. Okay, so hello everyone. Thank you for being here. My name is Sami Kenisi. I'm joined here with my colleague, uh, Mariam Bujil Ben, and we are both PhD students uh, at the University of Louisville. We are advised by Dr. Orfana Sarawi. So we're, we're going to present our paper, uh, Theoretical Modeling of uh, Iterative Properties of User Discovery and Collaborative Filtering Recommender System. So, and this work has been funded by NSF. Okay. So imagine after a hard day uh, of work, you go home and decide to watch a movie. So since you like action movies, the recommender system will recommend you more action movies. Now, let's say the same thing happens the next day, and when you decide to watch another movie, the recommender systems keep recommending another action movie. So at this point, you start being less interested in the recommendations. And if this scenario happens for more iterations, you become really frustrated with the recommendations and you lose interest in them. So you find yourself trapped in a filter bubble. And now here we use movie as an example, but the same thing can happen with other types of recommendations that we use daily, such as jobs or news. So this is due to the closed feedback loop bias in your recommender systems. So this closed feedback bias causes exposure bias where the user only rates items that are observed. So this can cause, as we discussed, filter bubble, polarization, or underexposure for items. So on this, uh, in this work, we will discuss this feedback loop problem. So uh, our, main, our main contributions here are, uh, we're gonna present a theoretical framework of the evolution of a recommender systems feedback loop. We're gonna also provide a theoretical bound on the user discovery. Uh, we're gonna verify empirically the theoretical results and empirically also we're gonna ch uh, challenge standard exploration approaches and their effectiveness in uh, increasing the user discovery. So well, we will start by defining uh, the problem annotations. We define I as the set of all available items and G as the set of groups of items based on some criteria like genres or predefined similarity metric. So in this work, we work, uh, in this work, we work with groups of similar items rather than individual items. Also, we define S as the set of seen groups of items. A seen group means that you have seen some items belonging to that group. Example, so if uh, if we group based on genres, if you see an action movie, we consider the action movie groups as a single group. Uh, we also define B as the blind spot of the user, which are groups that are not seen uh, to, uh, that are not seen by the user, but they may be relevant. Okay, so let's describe the process of the recommendation in a classical uh, setting. So uh, first, the user uh, sees some groups of items. Then the user provides feedback uh, for those items in the form of ratings or clicks. So these ratings will be used by a model to learn and provide a set of recommendations. Then these recommendations will be seen by the user to form ST. 
Finally, the process will repeat itself for the next iteration, T. So using this framework, we'll study the asymptotic behavior of delta S defined by the increase in the number of new groups between the consecutive iterations. And the delta BT defined as the decrease in the number of unseen and relevant groups between consecutive iterations. Okay, so before going through the theoretical results, uh, we'll define the assumptions used in this work. So the first assumption is what we call the vacuum assumption. So we assume that the set of seen groups is only affected by the recommendations uh, of the algorithm. So there are no other factors like other platform recommendations or recommendations from France, etc. So this uh, may of course seem restrictive, however, it is essential. So uh, to allow us to derive the first step of our theory, so uh, to isolate the impact of the feedback loop alone with no other factors, and also has the advantage that it allows us to gradually add in more factors in the futures and see how this changes the theory. We also uh, assume that the user will rate all the seen items. We call this the perfect feedback uh, assumption. And we realize, of course, that also this is uh, not realistic. However, it is essential to be able to derive the initial theory with the additional advantage of allowing us to isolate the influence of recommended system algorithm that we can control from uh, that of the human's behavior, which is obviously harder to control. So despite the assumptions and to be more realistic, we will later empirically challenge this assumption by making the user only rate a few items depending on their ranks. Finally, uh, we assume that a group of items has a higher probability of being recommended if it has been seen before. This is uh, probably uh, the strongest assumptions as it assumes a pure exploitation strategy, but we will later empirically show that even if this assumption is violated, our bounds still hold. So uh, our first result here is the lemma 3.5. Uh, uh, this is where we show that ST can be considered as a filtrations and the random process defined by the cardinality of ST is a martingale. So filtrations and martingales have very interesting uh, statistical properties that will help define the asymptotic behavior for the user discovery. So uh, in fact, using the Azuma holding inequality on the martingale difference delta ST, we can prove the following bound on the average user discovery, meaning that on average, through many iteration, the user discovery cannot exceed this value. So we see that the, uh, the bound here depends on the recommendation list length. Uh, in fact, if the recommendation list is smaller then the bound is tighter. What is interesting is that the theory agrees here with the intuition. And we also want to remind that in this analysis, uh, we always study on the level of groups, not individual items. So furthermore, by noticing the relation between the number of iterations and the average user discovery, we can prove that the delta NS converges to zero almost surely. This means that after many iterations, the average user discovery will stagnate. Furthermore, this result can be uh, extended to the blind spot of the user. Similarly, we can show that the user's blind spot decrease will also converge to zero almost surely, meaning that after a few iterations, the blind spot will not decrease anymore and there are groups of items that are not explored. Uh, by the user, as seen here in the illustrative example. So now to verify our results, uh, we use the Movilance Vermilion dataset, which has 6,040 users, uh, 3,952 items, and a rating density of 4%. We also used 18 journals as uh, the items groups. And for our recommendation model, we use matrix factorization. So first, we designed an experiment to validate the ranking inception. In fact, by sampling users and comparing the average ratings, we found that the seen groups of items have a significant higher average predicted rating than the, uh, than the not seen groups, uh, which can validate, of course, in the setting, the, uh, the ranking assumption. So next, in order to validate our theoretical result, we provide the following process. First, uh, we use a semi-synthetic data set uh, which means uh, that the Movilans uh, data is completed using a matrix completion uh, method to mimic the real world data. So more uh, details on how we generated this data is all, on the paper. But basically we used like previous methods used uh, in the literature. So our first step is to use the training data as the scene items in order to train the model. Then we present the recommendations to the user then the next batch of training data is constructed by the following union relationship. Then we calculate the cardinality of ST and BT, which will allow us to calculate other entities like the delta S and the delta B that we want to study. 
So uh, this process will reiterate for many iterations to mimic the behavior of a dynamic and uh, iterate uh, recommender system. Okay, so moving on now to our empirical results. So under our assumptions, we can see here the hyperbolic decrease in the user discovery. And we also show the theoretical bound here uh, for different level of uncertainty. So this shows that after some iterations, the system will convert to a static state that can be defined as a filter bubble or an echo chamber. Furthermore, we challenge the perfect feedback assumption, but uh, by assuming that the user does not trade all the recommended items, and this is closer to a realistic scenario. So we show that under this relaxation, the recommender system still limits the discovery of the user, since we not see the same level of decrease. Finally, we challenge the ranking assumption by using basic exploration strategy. So uh, this method ma managed to increase the discovery of the user, but they are still limited uh, by our theoretical bound. So we see here how uh, they increase the discovery, but the theoretical bound is still limiting the user discovery. Okay, so some additional observation here. So even though we did not adhere to the uh, perfect feedback assumptions and the ranking assumption, the system still leads to a feedback loop. And also, even though we did not use the groups, uh, or meaning the movie journals in this case in the training, the system uh, still withheld some groups from being recommended. And also, even though we use a small number of groups, in this case, less than 20, the user discovery converts to a state that fails to explore all the groups or all the journals in the data set. So finally, to conclude, we presented a simplified theoretical framework to study the closed feedback loop in a recommender system. Uh, we also showed that under certain inceptions, uh, the iterative uh, behavior of the recommender system tends to limit the user discovery. We used a simulation framework to empirically verify our theory and challenge the assumptions that we have made. So uh, now a main limitation of the work comes, of course, from its assumptions. So future work can theoretically challenge uh, these assumptions. Also, future work can leverage our theoretical framework to include the user discovery into the uh, optimization process to encourage diverse recommendations. So these are some of the references that we use in this work. Also, more, of course, more references can be found in our paper. And I welcome every questions. And also, you can reach us by email or LinkedIn. And also, our code is available on GitHub. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Sammy. Um, we do have time for a few questions. Um, I don't see any questions yet in our uh, on Whova, um, but I had one question. Uh, sure. So, well, I, I guess a broad question that I'd like to ask is that although you're focusing in here on collaborative filtering, it seems that your result is basically about some inherent aspects of just giving recommendations and how users provide feedback to recommendations, right? So it's not necessarily uniquely, uh, the, at least your theoretical results, just about collaborative recommendation. Is that correct? Uh, yes. So the collaborative filtering, uh, like mainly it, it comes through the assumption, the ranking assumption. So when we do the ranking assumption, like uh, we assume that if two items are close together in some space, this is basically the collaborative filtering uh, uh, approach, but yeah, if, if you use, for example, a content uh, filtering based approach, let's say like some kind of uh, extra information, yeah, this assumption can also be satisfied since, yes, yeah, so the model can learn some similarity between the items based on their features. And this assumption can still uh, be satisfied. But yeah, this, we should, this is very interesting. We should investigate like how. How, how collaborative filtering and content-based filtering can can diff or, or even the hybrid system can act in this case. Yeah, I don't know if I answered like. Yeah, I guess another uh, kind of a uh, uh, potential difference might be in the kind of algorithm that you're using, even yeah. in collaborative filtering, right? Yeah. So you're using matrix factorization, yeah. and there is a lot of different. Uh, things that go into that from the optimization kind of method yeah, that you're using yeah. to, uh, yeah. you've yeah. mentioned ma matrix completion, for example, potentially that could actually impact yeah. 
yeah, uh, exactly. you know, might amplify also, some of the effect of the filter bubble to some extent, right? Yeah, also like many other settings, like for example, it's like sequential recommendations, also some people use reinforcement learning as recommendations, so that also can play like, uh, yeah, interesting thing like is to uh, experiment on all these different methods and see how they converge. So one, I think uh, DeepMind uh, paper showed using some reinforcement learning, they that the user interest will decrease into uh, into time forming this echo chamber of filter bubble. This is kind of like similar to their work, uh, but using like another uh, like another view of it. Okay, we did get a question on who while I'm gonna read that. Maybe we can answer that quick quickly. We got about one minute. So, if users don't like iterative recommendation of same genres, then users uh, would give negative feedback after several iterations. Does it break the feedback loop? Because the question is, does the negative yeah, feedback is... can break the feedback loop? Yeah, that's very interesting. Yeah. Hmm. So, yeah, that that enters like on the next batch of recommendations. So when the the, the when the algorithm is gonna read like that negative feedback, how is is it comp is it going to compare with the previous uh, positive feedback? So because when we train, for example, for uh, now, like when we train for recommender systems, we don't we don't have that kind of sequential data usually. Like, so we only have like, for example, one, one rating matrix that have both positive and negative feedback. So without other informations like temporal or stuff like that, how do we know like that negative feedback is due to that filter bubble? So that, that would be very interesting to see, yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much, uh, Sammy. So um, uh, let's move to the next uh, paper. Uh, the title is Deconstructing the Filter Bubble User Decision Making and Recommender Systems. And the speaker is Guy Herdor. Guy, please go ahead and share your screen. Okay, cool. All right, thanks. Um, so yeah, so I'm gonna talk about our paper, Deconstructing the Filter Bubble. Uh, I'm Guy and this is joint work with Barkhan Kalvis and Sean Sikdar. So when we were starting out this project, we were originally interested in this broad question of understanding the consequences that recommender systems had on user consumption choices. And broadly speaking, the literature is focused on two issues. The first is whether recommender systems lead users into so-called filter bubbles which is the idea that users consume items in increasingly narrow portions of the product space over time as a result of recommendation. The second issue uh, that the literature has touched on is the issue of homogenization, which is the idea that users consume increasingly similar items as each other as a result of recommendation. And so we are in particular motivated by this paper, which look at the movie lens context and investigated empirically whether or not such filter bubble effects seem to play out in reality. And more or less what they found was that filter bubble effects seem to occur independently of recommendation. And if anything, uh, recommender systems seem to alleviate such an effect. And so what we set out to do in this paper was to first you know, construct an economic model to try to explain and rationalize some of these empirical results, and then turn to thinking about the implications that this potentially has for the design and evaluation of recommender systems. So our model, you know, we, we, we set out first to model, you know, what, how do users make decisions in context where recommender systems are traditionally deployed, such as like a Netflix or a Spotify. So the first component of the model is that users sequentially consume a small set of items from a really large choice set. And the thing that makes the user problem so challenging is that users are uncertain about items' true valuation. So if you think about, for instance, the movie context, a user doesn't necessarily know how much they like the movie John Wick, but in particular, they have beliefs about how much they're going to like it. And these beliefs are what drive consumption decisions. And because we allow for this uncertainty, we further have under some parameterizations, uh, we allow users to be risk averse, which is an idea from economic decision theory, which more or less says that a risk averse user will prefer something that's more certain to something that's less certain. The key portion of our model is how users sort of navigate this large product space. And so in particular, users value similar items similarly. So that if I consume an item, I learn the value of that item, but it also informs me about the possible valuation of similar items. So if you think of the movie domain, 
Suppose I watch the movie John Wick. That's going to give me information about the sequel to John Wick and other movies by Keanu Reeves. And the user in our model will update their beliefs about these items as well, based on the information it gets from consuming the item we just consumed. And this is going to uh, change consumption decisions in future periods. Finally, we think we model users' valuations as including an idiosyncratic and common value component, where both of these are draws from distinct Gaussians, and in particular to make three tractable. And we model recommendation as revealing the common value component. And we have some parameter that sort of moves around how much of the valuation depends on the idiosyncratic and common value component. And so recommendation here is modeled in a very stylized way, where it's the common value component paired with the user beliefs. So we evaluate this model via simulation over a grid of parameters, but the main intuition for the model and its results uh, can be summed up in this very simple example. Right? So we have an, a product space of four items. And in particular, item zero is more similar to item one and item three than it is to item two. And we're going to suppose at the beginning of the world that all the beliefs are the same. And we're in a Gaussian environment. So the uh, covariance matrix is given by some scaling factor. And then this row here is going to denote how correlated the ex post valuations are. So if it's zero, that means that the goods are completely independent of each other. If it goes to one, their valuations are perfectly correlated. Um, and so in particular, let's suppose arbitrarily that user consumes item zero because all the means, the mean beliefs are the same and that the realization of the utility for this item is Y. Then the updated beliefs are gonna be as follows, where in particular, the updated beliefs for items one and three are gonna update much stronger than for item two. And so this means that if the thing ends up being better than my mean belief, the user is always going to consume item one or three because it's going to have a higher mean. But even if the realization is lower than the, what I thought it was going to be, you know, I might, the user might still consume item two, even though it ha or item one or three, even though it has a lower mean belief. And it's because of how the covariance matrix adjusts as well. So this is for a particular value of rho. But what happens is that the degree of certainty also decreases for items one or three, precisely because they're more similar. And so in particular, um, if the user is sufficiently risk averse, they'll still consume item one or three. Right, and so the intuition as to why even independently of recommendation, users might consume increasingly similar items over time is because the informational spillover is sort of going to lead them potentially to get stuck in pockets of the product space where they have information and think the products are good, or they're just very risk averse. And this intuition more or less plays out in the, when we evaluate the model in full. Right, so here is just one plot from our paper where we looked at the consumption path over time um, where this is the average distance in the product space that a user moves under the no recommendation regime, under the recommendation regime, and under an Oracle regime, which is basically a perfect information benchmark when the user knows the true ex post valuation of all the goods. And so one, you see that the average distance for the no recommendation regime is lower than all the other ones, but also you see that it has a, a more declining path. And the intuition is just that recommendation here gives users information that sort of encourages them to search in other parts of the product space because that gives them information about where in that product space even begins searching. And so in particular, what drives the, the, the sort of filter bubble effects in the no recommendation case is really this spillover effect, right? So in the case when we shut down the spillover effect completely, we sort of see a flat consumption path. Whereas what, as we sort of prop up that the correlation parameter, you sort of see not only the, the level goes down, but also the slope seems to go down. So some additional re results we have from analyzing our model is first, you know, as you'd expect from my illustrative example, filter bubble effects are further amplified by risk aversion because these informational spillovers not only affect mean beliefs, but also affect the degree of uncertainty. The second thing we look into is, you know, in our model, what are the welfare gains from recommendation? Well, welf welfare here is defined in terms of the, the uh, set of valuations of the items that they actually consume and they actually experience not what they thought originally. And so what we find is that the welfare gains actually decrease as correlations between valuations increases. And the intuition is really clear. Basically, users can get information either from consumption or from recommendation. So when the, correla when the correlation between items is shut down, they only get information from recommendation, which leads to the highest gains in welfare. As this correlation increases, they get more information from consumption, which sort of crowds out the welfare gains they get from recommendation. 
Then we turn to looking, you know, at the relationship between diversity and welfare, right? Because, you know, diversity is often touted as something that should inherently be, you know, something we want. But we actually find in our model that without recommendation, diversity and welfare are negatively correlated. And the reason why is very clear is, again, sort of a user might experience a very non-diverse item set, but they might just be stuck in a relatively decent part of the product space. Whereas you could easily get a user with very high diversity, but the reason why they're doing so is they're sort of jumping around the product space because they keep finding bad items. And sort of when we introduce recommendation, it uh, alleviates both of these effects and we sort of find that it's uncorrelated. And in the paper, we have uh, some additional results about how this relates to risk aversion, which are interesting, but for the sake of time, I don't cover them here. Um, finally, we look at how a recommendation in, uh, uh, influences homogeneity and we find that it increases homogeneity both relative to the Oracle regime and the no recommendation regime, precisely because it coordinates uh, users around uh, high common value components. So that's the evaluation of the model. And the last part of the paper, we, we, we sort of sketch uh, what we think our model potentially teaches people about recommender system design and evaluation. And the first thing we tackle is we look at this, the, the, the folk wisdom that's emerged in, in the community that accurate recommendations are not necessarily the most useful recommendations. And this simple observation has spawned a number of different evaluation measures in the past decade or so. And the intuition as to why we think, you know, our model provides one explanation for why this might actually be the case. So let's think again to that John Wick example, right? So suppose the user like John Wick, you know, should the recommender system recommend John Wick chapter two, right? Any reasonably good, you know, content-based recommender system would pick up the connection right away. But if you take our model seriously, you know, rec the recommender systems traditionally ignore the inferences that users themselves make and ignore user beliefs entirely, right? But if you think about the implications for our model, the user would have made them this inference themselves. And so the recommendation of John Wick chapter two wouldn't be useful for the user precisely because it wouldn't be giving them any valuable information. And so the approach that we more we sketch in the paper, but don't go into much detail about, is sort of to pair the standard prediction problem with thinking about providing valuable information, where valuable information is defined in terms of steering user behavior towards better choices. And the implications of this is it's important then to not only collect the traditional data that's collected for recommender systems on post-consumption ratings or in the how much somebody likes something inferred for behavioral data but also on pre-consumption beliefs to have a better understanding of what users' thoughts are about the product space and what kind of information can guide them to better choices than they would um, without that information. Um, thanks, there's more discussion and uh, results in the paper, um, but uh, thanks. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we do have one question. Um, from Peter Bruslavsky. Uh, and the question is, the model so far assumes that the user is looking for items by herself and drives herself into a bubble, but people could follow suggestions of friends and other external signals or based on other external signals. Would that impact the model? That's a, that's a good question, right? I mean, usually when we think about these sorts of issues, we really think, you know, okay, so there's the user and then what's the influence that recommend, recommender systems in particular have, right? But in essence, you know, the recommender system is, is in some sense playing the same role that, you know, our friends and family do outside of recommendation, right? So it's sort of hard to think about how that would affect the model because you can kind of think, you know, maybe, you know, even the individual that's, you know, not, not, following, not following the recommender system or not having access to some recommender system has access to friends and family, which give them information. Um, so it's sort of hard to, you know, come up with a good answer to that question. Um, but yeah, so I mean, in our model, we sort of suppose that the user only gets information from consumption. So, you know, you would think that the, you, the person that only follows uh, recommendation from, you know, friends and family would fall somewhere in the middle. But in terms of how that affects the formalisms of the model, I'd have to think a bit more about that offline, to be honest. Um, so I'm sorry, that's a little bit of an unsatisfying answer, but 
Uh, I'll think more about it and respond in Huba later if I come up with something better. <laughs> okay, that sounds good. All right, we don't have any other questions at the moment, so uh, let's uh, move on to, I'm sorry, yeah. Uh, okay. Yep. Um, yes, so the next paper, sorry, I'm just uh, trying to get to it here, uh, is titled Global and Local Differential Privacy for Collaborative Bandits, and uh, speaker is Huazheng Wang. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, hello, hello everyone. Uh, this is Huazheng from University of Virginia. Uh, it is my great honor to present the paper, uh, Global and Local Differential Privacy for Collaborative Bandits. Uh, this is a joint work with my uh, collaborators from University of Virginia and Bloomberg. Um, so, uh, bandit algorithms is now widely used in many real world recommender systems. Uh, it models the recommendation task as a sequential decision problem, uh, where the bandit algorithm sequentially decide which item to recommend, uh, uh, in order to maximize the accumulated reward. Uh, the bandit algorithm estimates user's preference on the fly and needs to balance the exploitation and exploration. Recently, there's uh, uh, increasing concerns on the privacy issues with respect to the uh, uh, re with respect to the machine learning systems, especially to the recommender systems. Uh, several researchers have shown that uh, users' uh, private information is vulnerable uh, under uh, extraction attack. So, in this paper, our goal is to design privacy-preserving uh, bandit algorithms for recommender system. The goal is to uh, protect the privacy of users' reward feedback. Uh, we use the notion of differential privacy, uh, where the goal is the adversary cannot differentiate a reward, uh, whether it's in the history or not, given the, uh, recomm the recommendation sequence. So uh, since we are working with uh, private collaborative bandits, the first line of related work is collaborative bandits. Uh, so linear bandits is a classical model uh, uh, for uh, bandit algorithms that assumes the reward is a linear product between item feature X and user's unknown feature theta. Uh, one major drawback is it independently uh, estimates uh, or models each user's preference. So if you have n users, you will need to build n linear bandits uh, for every user which is inefficient and easily suffers from code stop problem. And this drawback motivates the recent advances of collaborative bandits, which tries to leverage user dependency uh, for joint model estimation and recommendation. Uh, one line of collaborative bandits uh, use existing user dependency information, for example, social graph connections uh, to model uh, such user dependency for this fast learning and exploration. Uh, there are other lines of collaborative bandits. For example, uh, some of them try to discover uh, user dependency on the fly via online classroom technique. Uh, those are not our focus in this paper, and we leave it. We leave the. Uh, we leave it as future works. Uh, so, in terms of privacy concerns, we adopt the classical notion of differential privacy. Uh, where this, uh, so here is the uh, mathematical definition and the intuition is that by looking at the algorithm's output O, uh, which in our, uh, in our case uh, is the recommendation sequence from the bandit algorithm, an adversary cannot differentiate whether a, re, a, a certain reward or certain data point is presented in the historical, uh, is it, uh, presented in the history or not. So uh, based on this definition, uh, there are some existing works on designing private linear bandits. So uh, uh, differentially private linear UCB algorithms uh, is developed where the algorithm add noise in the closed form estimator of ridge regression. So here uh, in this box, the closed form estimator of ridge regression is uh, theta hat uh, equals to this matrix inverse times this vector bt, where this bt equals to the summation of 
rewards times the fee tracks. Uh, so the idea, the algorithm's idea is to add noise to this BT vector because it contains the sensitive information uh, users reward R. Uh, it used a tree-based aggregation, which essentially samples uh, Laplace noise from, uh, from this certain distribution. So the variance of this Laplace noise uh, is related to uh, sensitivity delta, uh, log t, and uh, epsilon. So here, epsilon is the privacy budget. Uh, delta is the sensitivity which describes the maximum change in this BT vector when one reward difference. Uh, so it is bounded by a constant L uh, for a linear bandit because in linear bandits, this difference uh, can be separately bounded uh, by the rewards difference, which is a constant, and also the L2 norm of the features, which is another constant. So in total, one can see the sensitivity is a constant. Uh, so in our paper, we present a uh, framework to design private collaborative bandits. Uh, our main idea is to add noise during the model estimation similarly, and also scale the noise based on the sensitivity. Uh, one unique challenge for collaborative learning is that one user's reward is used to update all users' estimation. So, which means one, uh, which means one user's reward can uh, uh, can uh, change the behavior of all users' parameter. So, it seems suggest it is more sensitive than uh, independent linear bandits. And uh, the main challenge is how large is this sensitivity? And we, uh, we answer this by calibrating this sensitivity with respect to the structure of collaboration, which essentially is the user dependency structure. We use a goblin algorithm as an example uh, of collaborative bandit algorithm. So this algorithm uh, assumes use, uh, connected users in the social graph uh, share similar model parameters. It uses a graph Laplace based regularization of Hungary regression to model this dependency. So uh, intuitively, it means that uh, for users connected to each other, it will push the parameter closer. Uh, so this algorithm uh, can be modeled as by encoding the graph Laplace matrix in the context vector, and it can be formulated as a DN dimensional linear CB. So although originally it's like uh, every users uh, have a parameter, it can be modeled jointly by a big linear regression. Uh, in DN dimensional. dimensional. Uh, so our uh, designed uh, DP uh, goblin algorithm, the idea is still add noise to, uh, to the corresponding uh, BT vector via tree-based aggregation protocol. Uh, so, and um, the algorithm will make recommendation with this noisy model. So the question is, what is the sensitivity delta of BT for this goblin algorithm? A trivial solution is it's n times l, uh, because now the context by uh, be in, because encoded with graph Laplace matrix it's dn dimensional, so n times longer. Uh, so the trivial solution is uh, sensitivity is n times larger. But actually, in our paper we show that a tight sensitivity analysis suggests this delta is uh, related to the user dependency structure G, which is related to the graph Laplace matrix here. So an uh, intuitive example uh, explanation is when users are independent, then we have delta equals to L, which go means it goes back to the independent uh, linear CB's case. While when users are fully connected to each other, this delta actually equals to, uh, is equals to a smaller uh, value. Uh, the intuition is that although uh, when users are connected, one reward uh, might lead to change to every user's model, but the total uh, change or the total scale is actually smaller. So the observation is actually collaboration helps to reduce the noise needed to achieve differential privacy. Uh, so, to, so to measure the cost of differential privacy, we use the regret analysis, which, uh, which is defined as the difference between the optimal selection and optimal recommendation and the recommendation made by the algorithm. We want a, a sublinear regret uh, and we will quantify the additional regret caused by this uh, differential privacy mechanism. Uh, so in our paper, we show that this uh, additional term as illustrated in this uh, red box 
it's uh, linear to the sensitivity uh, delta and in the order of square root of t log to the power of 1.5 t. Uh, we also define, designed a local differential privacy mechanism which where the data is randomized on the user side before sent to the aggregator and is a, a stronger privacy definition. So the idea is uh, now each user needs to maintain their own BT vector on their local devices and the algorithm will add, no add noise on the uh, user side. Uh, and to summarize is uh, in this paper, we actually proposed a uh, framework, general framework to for uh, uh, privacy collaborative bandits. So the general idea is uh, to formulate the problem as linear bandits, uh, use tree-based aggregation to add noise, and needs to carefully uh, calibrate the noise scale with respect to the user dependency graph. Uh, so in our paper, we also showed another example to equip uh, global and local differential privacy for another collaborative bandit, which is the coding algorithm where the content and opinion sharing is modeled via a weighted uh, social network matrix W. Uh, so in terms of experiments, we first run some simulation to look at the added regrets caused by differential privacy mechanism. And we can see that the local differential privacy algorithm suffers much larger regrets because of larger noise in the model. Uh, we also have uh, evaluated on real world data set. One is a delicious data set where uh, the social network structure is known for all the users. Uh, you may check out check our paper for more results on different data sets and also different uh, privacy budget value epsilon. Uh, so in conclusion, uh, in this paper, uh, the main contribution is we proposed a framework to equip collaborative bandits with differential privacy and local differential privacy. Uh, our uh, idea is to calibrate the noise scale with respect to the user dependency uh, graph. And we use regret analysis to quantify the additional regret caused by noise injection. Uh, in terms of future work, uh, we, uh, the first is we want to study uh, differential privacy for other types of collaborative bandits. For example, uh, online clustering-based bandits or matrix factorization-based algorithms. Uh, another question is about the regret lower bound. Uh, we want to understand what is the minimum added regret required to achieve uh, differential privacy uh, in order to understand whether our uh, proposed strategy is really optimal. Uh, so we thank Bloomberg Data Science Fellowship and NSF for supporting this research, and our code will be available soon on the on this uh, GitHub repo. Uh, thank you. And uh, any questions? Thank you very much. So at the moment, we don't have any questions on uh, Huwa. Um, I did have one question. Um, most of the work that you did was based on uh, uh, sort of the UCB algorithm or variations right. of UCB algorithm. Have you uh, looked at uh, other bandit algorithms, uh, for example, based on Thompson sampling? Yeah, that's that's methods? a good point. Actually, uh, that's something I've been considering, although I didn't explicitly mention as future work, because uh, there are indeed some unique properties in Thompson sampling because that algorithm itself is already randomized. So uh, uh, a really interesting question to answer is, can we, uh, uh, can we view this uh, intrinsic randomness in Thompson sampling as some kind of privacy protection already? Yeah, that's, that's uh, something, uh, that's an interesting question to answer, unique for Thompson sampling. But uh, again, it's, it's a good question. Like uh, there are many potential uh, research potentials in for for like Thompson sampling, uh, like algorithm or other type of bandits, yeah. Because in Thompson sampling, you can actually also just vary the kind of distribution you're using initially. Yeah, yeah. right. Which could potentially allow you to uh, model this. Yes. Um, you, you mentioned that you use the delicious to do, mm -hmm. to, to sort of simulate this on real data. How, right. So what, how would you measure the, like for example, regrets using delicious? Oh, uh, so so yeah. Uh, as you see here, we use the we use the reward 
uh, we use the rewards here. Um, what, what so in, in Delicious, we, yeah, because because it's it's not that easy to uh, really accurately define regrets on on, on real world data set because it's hard to say whether this is an optimal choice in uh, real world data, but. In a simulation, it's because everything is simulated, so we can evaluate the regret there. Right. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, so, could you uh, stop sharing your uh, screen? Okay. Yes. Okay. So, we move on to our next paper, which is uh, towards safety and sustainability. Designing local recommendations for post-pandemic world, and the speaker is Gurab Patro. Go ahead, Gurab. Uh, is the slide visible? Yeah, we can see. Okay, so uh, I'm afraid I'm I won't be able to uh, start my video because uh, the bandwidth here is very low. So. I'll I'll just continue with the slides and my audio part only. I guess that's fine. It seems fine right now. So you want to go okay. ahead? Yeah. Uh, hello and namaste to everyone. Uh, I'm Gaurav Kumar Patro. I'm a PhD student at IIT Kharagpur. I'll be presenting our work on designing local recommendations for post-pandemic world. This is a joint work with Avigyan from MPIHWS, Asmi from TU Munich, and my advisor Nilay from IIT Kharagpur. Let us start the presentation with a basic introduction to local recommendations. Local recommendation services use GPS-based location data along with other input preferences and then recommend the nearby businesses like uh, restaurants, cafes, bars, etc. to the customers. Such services are available on platforms like Google Local, Zomato, etc. These services uh, highly influence how customers choose and visit local businesses. In fact, in 2016, more than 1.5 billion businesses have been visited every month by the customers using these services. However, the customer business physical interactions have been severely impacted due to COVID-19 pandemic. With more than 25 million infections and no established cure or vaccine, the first response of most of the countries in the world was uh, partial or full lockdowns, which led to huge economic losses for businesses. So the countries have opened up with uh, social distancing guidelines, and this has brought some balance to customer safety and also economic sustainability. Now, the key question we try to answer here is that, can we design mechanisms leveraging the popularity of local recommendation services to systematically improve both customer safety and economic sustainability in this post-pandemic world? Before answering this question, first we have to see how suitable are the pre-COVID local recommendations for this post-pandemic world. So we gather and analyze some real-world data on this. First, we collect publicly available uh, Foursquare check-in locations data of New York and San Francisco. We use these locations as the locations of the customers in these cities, and then gather the recommendations provided by Yelp and Google Local. Note that all these data sets were gathered during pre-COVID times in 2019. So the recommendations are from pre-COVID times, and the analysis of these recommendations can show the suitability of pre-COVID recommendations today. We consider the gathered recommendations as ranked recommendations. So with the existence of position bias or ranking bias, the top ranks get more customer attention than the lower ones. Here we use standard NDCG logarithmic drop-off for these attention scores of different ranks. Now, based on the ranks of a business in recommendations over time, we amortize these attention scores and call it as the exposure of that business. We then plot the learning score for the business exposures. On x-axis, we have the cumulative percentage of businesses whom we have sorted in increasing order of their exposures. And on y-axis, we have the cumulative percentage of the exposure of those corresponding businesses. The tail broken line, which is the diagonal line, represents the equality mark. If the Lorentz curve is closer to the diagonal line, it means that the businesses have almost equal exposures. 
However, in all the data sets, we, we see all the all these uh, Lorentz curves to appear far below the diagonal. So there is huge inequality in business exposures. Here we have shown the Lorentz curve for Google's New York data. Other plots are also available in the paper. The exposure of a business often leads to customer footfall and economic uh, sustainability or e economic opportunity. So uh, very low exposure can mean low sustainability. On the other hand, very high exposure can lead to huge crowds at the overexposed businesses, which is not desirable for social distancing and customer safety concerns. So just by redistributing the extra crowd and or the extra exposure among the less exposed businesses, we could solve the uh, concerns for safety and sustainability. Probably a naive way of doing that is poorest care recommendation. So in this poorest care recommendation, uh, every, every time a new customer comes up to the platform, we recommend the K least exposed businesses at that instant, and we call it as the poorest care recommendation. Now we again plot the Lorentz curves for poorest care recommendations. The Lorentz curve for poorest care, which is in black color, they appear uh, almost uh, very close to the diagonal line. They, all, they even coincide with the diagonal line, which is the equality mark. This means that poorest care achieves very low inequality, and uh, uh, which could be the answer to safety and sustainability. However, we also have to see how it performs on the customer utility front. We use standard NDCG measure with logarithmic drop-off for customer utility. As we don't have the uh, true relevance scores of uh, the platforms, we, uh, we conducted a survey, uh, customer survey, uh, which, in which we collected uh, many of the uh, preferences of different users uh, when, when they select uh, different restaurants to visit. So based on these, uh, these uh, survey results, we actually created personalized learning to rank models and we consider these uh, learning to rank uh, uh, models outputs as the true relevance or the true customer utility. Now using the NDCG utility metric, we find that poorest care causes around 60% loss in customer utility in comparison to the pre-COVID recommendation or top care recommendations. While the traditional pre-COVID top care recommendations achieve high customer utility, it is not suitable for customer safety and business sustainability. On the other hand, poorest care, which is a nice solution, is better for customer uh, safety and uh, business sustainability while it performs bad in customer utility. Therefore, we need to consider the notions of safety, sustainability, and utility all together while designing local recommendations. Next, we formally define this, uh, define the desiderata for all these three notions. For business sustainability, we propose to ensure a minimum exposure guarantee for businesses. It is very similar to minimum wage guarantee in labor markets. For customer safety, we propose to keep the exposure of a business less than a minim maximum limit, which is, uh, which is proportional to the safe capacity of that business. For detailed explanations on how we find the safe capacity of a business and the corresponding upper limit on exposure, please refer to our paper. While improving safety and sustainability, we would also like to keep the customer uh, utility very high. Now, as these three notions are hard constraints and cannot be achieved together, we find relaxed versions of these notions and express them as uh, optimization objectives. The minimum exposure guarantee can be relaxed to minimizing exposure deficit. And the upper bound on exposure can be relaxed to minimizing exposure surplus. Maximum customer utility can be relaxed to minimizing utility loss while designing this pandemic aware recommendations. We combine the relaxed objectives in a joint optimization problem. Here, lambda 1, lambda 2, and 1 minus lambda 1 minus lambda 2 are the weights for sustainability, safety, and utility objectives, respectively. Now, the goal here is that at any customer instance, we have to allot ranks to businesses so that the joint optimization objective is minimized. We solve this by mapping it to a bipartite matching problem, which has polynomial time solutions. 
and we also provide uh, an approximation method in which uh, we could further improve the complexity. More details uh, on this can be found in the paper. We apply this approach on the gathered datasets and analyze the results. First, we use Gini index for inequality in business exposures. High value represents high inequality, which is bad for business sustainability. We find that traditional top K recommendation causes high inequality, while the poorest K has the lowest inequality. However, in our proposed method, we see an increase in lamb uh, with the with the increase in lambda one. We see a decrease in uh, exposure inequality. Therefore, an improvement in e uh, economic sustainability for the businesses. For customer safety, we measure mean exposure surplus of businesses. High values represent high chances of overcrowding. So low values represent better uh, customer safety. We observe that top K with lowest, uh, observe that top K achieves very, uh, very low customer safety and poorest K has the highest customer safety. On the other hand, our proposed method significantly improves the customer safety with the increase in lambda two. On customer utility front, while top K ensures maximum utility and the poorest K causes uh, significant losses in customer utility, our proposed method causes only marginal losses in customer utility. Now, summarizing our results, the traditional pre-COVID top K recommendations ensures uh, maximum utility while failing to uh, consider sustainability and safety viewpoints. The naive method which is the poorest K gives the best performance in safety and sustainability while being worst for the customer utility. Our proposed method significantly improves both customer safety and sustainability while causing only marginal losses in customer utility. Detailed results along with more metrics and more baselines can be found in the paper. In addition to the very timely notions of uh, safety and sustainability, our proposed method is easily adaptable, and it also provides a three-way control over safety, sustainability, and utility through hyperparameter settings. This is highly useful in current scenario as the hyperparameters can be dynamically set according to the need of the situation. The datasets and codes will be available in the provided link. Thank you for listening to our talk. You can also follow our research group on Twitter at Synergy, C-N-E-R-C. Thank you. OK, thank you very much. Very interesting work. Um, we do have one question on who uh, I'll read it. It does look like your original goals could be achieved by using reciprocal recommendation ideas. These are the kind of recommendation used to match users uh, of dating sites. Could you stress how you approach your approach uh, differs from reciprocal recommendation? So mm, the the approach we followed is a, is a post processing method. So uh, we do not uh, we do not. Uh, 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 in our method, we do not uh, consider what exactly the platform follows. So it could be uh, it could be a very platform specific method in which uh, the platform finds out uh, the relevant scores for different uh, uh, restaurant and uh, customer pair. And there could be many business specific logics. Uh, also, they are defined by the platform itself. So we do not consider uh, these things. So that's why we take the outputs of these relevant scoring models that are specifically designed by the platforms, and then we can apply this uh, apply this method which we have de designed. So it's it's kind of uh, very adaptable to uh, whatever relevant scoring method uh, you use, and even adaptable to if you uh, change the relevant scoring method in in the mid. So I guess that's that's where the difference lies. OK. Uh, one question I guess I have is, uh, have you considered the, um, uh, so I mean, different venues are going to have different capacities, right? So uh, yeah. if, if you have a large enough venue, potentially, you know, the overcrowding could be avoided. So that you're, it could be less sensitive to uh, overexposure. Is that something that you have considered in your model? 
Yes, we have actually uh, we have actually uh, used a uh, tool designed by a Max Planck Institute in Germany, which uh, uses a form of Monte Carlo simulations and uh, uh, takes the input, uh, which is the size and shape of the area that the business has, and uh, what is the safe distance. Based on these things, uh, it calculates uh, calculates the safe capacity of each and every business. So the safe capacity is uh, different for each of the businesses in, in our data set. So I think more details are there in, in our paper. Uh, so I guess, yeah, we, we are considering uh, different safe capacities for different businesses. It might be low for small businesses and then high for bigger businesses. Okay, thank you very much. All right, so let's uh, go ahead and move on to our next paper, uh, which is titled uh, Revisiting Adversarially Learned Injection Attacks Against Recommender Systems. And our speaker is Joshi Tang. Hi, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Um, okay. Uh, yeah, this is Joshi. I'm from uh, uh, Google, uh, and uh, I'm glad to present our work. Uh, for... When you share your screen, can you uh, put it on? Uh, um, can you maximize your screen size? I see for yeah. some reason I'm seeing only half. I don't know. If... Uh, let me present again. Sorry. Uh, not working. Oh, I see. I see. Does it work now? Yeah, we can only see half of the screen, half of the. Uh... Mm -hmm. Yeah, no worries. I, I think I can just uh, go over the slides by uh, without presenting. Okay. Does well, it sound uh, good? Can you actually reduce the size? So go go back to like the uh, speaker view rather than the presentation. Mm. Okay, go ahead. Start it again, or share your screen. Okay, just just leave it like that. Okay, sounds good. Yeah, uh, and this is Jiaxi. I'm glad to present our paper, Revi Revisiting Adversarial, Adversarial Attack Against Rexis. And this is a joint work with Hong Yi uh, from Cornell University and uh, my supervisor, Ki Wang. Actually, I uh, want to mention that attacks can happen in real world recommender system. And uh, the rule of thumb to defend such attack is to understand how the attacks are performed. And this is a major motivation of our work. In this work, we perform such an attack, and we try to understand uh, some characteristics of this kind of attack. And uh, we propose a threat model uh, where we assume the attacker can have fully or partial knowledge about the data set used by the target recommender system. And the attacker will use their own recommender system uh, with this data set to create some fake data fake data, and uh, to uh, attack their own local recommender system. And then after uh, the attacker attack their own model, the attacker can inject such fake data to the tra training data of the target model. And uh, after the, uh, the, the poison data are consumed by the target model, the attacker can achieve their goal which in this paper, we assume the attacker's goal is to promote certain items of availability of being recommended. And uh, recall that uh, the first step uh, is the attacker will uh, attack their own model. And uh, uh, by saying that, uh, the attacker will let their own local model to first consume the injected fake data, which means the, it will let the model to train from scratch with the poison data set. And uh, by saying that, uh, actually, we are optimizing the surrogate model parameter theta 
by minimizing the training objective L train, uh, defined our Sorry. both. Yep. Sorry to interrupt you, but so on the uh, live version, we are actually not seeing the, any of the slides. Oh. Um, Why don't you see if you can try to share one more time? I, one other possibility is we could, uh, George could play the video. Sounds good, yeah. It was? You could see it? I can't see it on who uh, when I'm. Okay. If it was working, let's, uh, let's that continue the way. Good. Sounds good. Uh, and uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, do what you were doing before. Yeah. I see, okay, yeah, okay. Is this okay, George? You can see it. That's my, uh, yeah. Go ahead, Sorry. share. Yeah. yeah, just like that. Okay, sounds good, yeah. Uh, and after we got this uh, uh, optimal surrogate model parameter, theta star, we can then use the theta star to pre predict normal data prediction. And uh, the adversarial objective is defined uh, on the normal, on the prediction of normal data. Uh, for example, if we want to promote some target item, we can define the adversarial objective as a softmax cross, en cross entropy with label as the target item. And as we can see from the two equations, uh, there are two optimization problems and they are associated with the theta star which means the attacking problem uh, can be considered as a bi-level optimization problem. And to solve this uh, bi-level optimization problem, we can uh, use brute force approach, which means we can first change a value in the fake data. Uh, for example, we can flip one zero to one, and then we optimize the inner objective, which means we get theta star, the best segregated model parameters, and after we have the theta star, we make a prediction on normal data, and we evaluate our adversarial objective. And we do this again and again until we find the best fake data that can minimize the adversarial objective. But the thing is, the search base is uh, super large. So a smarter way is to use gradient-based approach, which means we still train the uh, surrogate model based on the new fake data. Uh, and this time, we obtain the gradient of uh, adversarial objective with respect to the fake data. And we update the fake data according to the gradient. And we can repeat this uh, procedure until, we, until the adversarial objective get converged. But the challenge is how we can compute such gradient. Uh, well, it is uh, non-trivial because uh, we can use MF as a surrogate model. So recall that we have to first make a prediction on normal data after we have the best parameter of MF. And uh, to do the prediction, uh, MF, is, uh, ju MF just need a multiplication of user latent factors and the item latent factors. After we get this prediction, we can compute uh, the adversarial objective, which, we can, uh, which is defined as a softmax cross entropy loss uh, with the label as target item. But uh, as we can see from the equation here, the fake data is not directly involved, which means the partial derivative uh, doesn't exist. And this is a well-known issue uh, posted by other paper as well, uh, which means uh, if we use MF, uh, maybe the partial objective uh, is not exist. Uh, and some work uh, as try to estimate uh, this partial derivative, and the, some work uh, tend to use uh, some other specific models to generate the, the attack. But the, the thing is, there is another part that can be tractable for IMF. And if you look at the computational graph, we can see uh, the first, the inner objective uh, is defined as follows. Uh, we start from the, uh, theta zero, which is the initial, initialized value of surrogate model parameters. And uh, we have this uh, training loss 
uh, object uh, training loss gradient with respect to the theta uh, computed by uh, x and the x hat, which is uh, normal data and the fake data. And then we update this uh, theta zero uh, with the optimizer. For example, we can use SJD or Adam. And we do this again and again until we get our theta star, which is a theta L here. And we use theta L to predict uh, the normal data, and we evaluate the adversarial objective. And this is a forward pass of this, uh, uh, how we evaluate the adversarial objective. Uh, and uh, we can see actually the fake data is involved in the forward pass, which means uh, we can use backpropagation. And uh, here is an example of su such gradient if we can use uh, SJD as optimizer. So as we can see, the gradient uh, has have some nasty forms, but uh, uh, but fortunately we can use TensorFlow and PyTorch so that we can justify the forward pass and uh, use automatic differentiation. And another issue is uh, forward pass needs a huge com uh, huge storage because if we optimize the inner objective for say 10 times, then we need 10 copies of the surrogate model parameter. And uh, in our paper, we show, uh, uh, we show some way to approximate such computation. Uh, in terms of the experimental results, uh, first we did uh, uh, the experiment on the synthetic dataset with WRMF as both surrogate model and the victim model. And we found the adversarial objective is successfully optimized over iterations. And the attack performance, which is the uh, orange bar, it's, go, it's getting better uh, along with the iteration. And interestingly, the re recommendation performance, which is the uh, yellow bar, doesn't affect too much. And on the real world data set, uh, we can uh, first look at the baseline. Well, our baseline is a pink bar, which is a heuristic approach that clicks the target item as well as some other random items. And our approach is a green one, which uses uh, MF as surrogate model. So from this plot, we can see the attack uh, even though we cr craft the attack using MF, which is a shallow model, the attack uh, can still be effective on deeper model. And also the attack is still effective on other uh, on a model with other scoring function. And also surprisingly, the attack can be still effective on the similarity-based approaches. And if we look at the click pattern, we can see the heuristic method clicks indiscriminately, which is expected. Is expected. And our learned uh, fake data doesn't have too much discrepancy from normal data. But if you look at uh, the pattern from latent space, we can see that the heuristic-based approach, uh, the fake data from heuristic-based approach are highly, highly correlated in latent space. But the learned fake data are much less correlated in the latent space. To summarize, uh, we showed uh, Actually, every model-based recommender can be used to generate the fake data uh, and perform the attack. And also, we propose ways to approximate the gradient computation so that we can reduce the complexity. And we show that an attack with MF as surrogate model can achieve significant impact. And uh, finally, the acknowledgment. Actually, my supervisor is supported by the grant from NSERC, and I, I'm uh, supported by Google. And our group is working on uh, real-world recommendation problems, and we are releasing uh, official library for TensorFlow recommenders. And um, here is the GitHub repo. If you uh, want to know more detail, please check the, our GitHub repo. And hopefully, uh, this library can help with your research. Thanks. OK, thank you very much. And uh, sorry for the few glitches in the beginning, but I think Everything worked out. So very interesting work. Uh, we don't have any questions at the moment on Hua, and we are a bit short on time. But I just wanted to ask you a quick question. You, on your paper, you say that some of the previous work in this area, they sort of assume the attacker has uh, sort of a complete knowledge, basically, for the attack. But actually, it's possible. I think some of the early work in this area looked at situations where the attacker can use knowledge, common knowledge about like popularity of items, for example, and things like that to try to uh, mount an attack. So here you're not making any assumptions, but- uh, Actually, uh, uh, the assumption I'm making- Yeah, go ahead. Yes, yeah, so actually the assumption making uh, make in our paper is uh, the, it's only the 
uh, the attacker can fully or partial observe the data set used by the, the target recommender. Uh, but uh, in some other works, uh, they even assume that uh, the, uh, the surrogate model is visible to the attacker, which is uh, usually not really realistic. Yeah. And how do you, how would somebody prevent an attack like this? Uh, that's a good question. I think uh, we may need <laughs> some future work. Uh, I, I think a naive approach is uh, you have to uh, control the the fake data. Uh, the data general, uh, you have to control the, the training data because uh, some of your training data might be uh, might be polluted by others. Yeah, but but the the attack doesn't really depend that much on the training data, right? The attacker can l learn it on their own local sort of uh, model. Yeah, but the attacker have to inject uh, this fake data into the training data of target model. Yeah. So we have to take care of of our training data before we train the model. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Um, so the. Uh, Next paper um, is uh, called uh, Debiasing Item to Item Recommendations with Small Annotated Datasets. Our speaker is Tobias Chernobyl. Hi, uh, can you hear me? Yep. And I hope you can see the screen too. Awesome. You're good. All right, cool. Um, thanks everyone for tuning in or staying until the end. Um, my name is uh, Tobias Schnabel, and this is joint work with Paul Bennett. Say something like, uh, someone likes the movie Toy Story, which uh, movie would you recommend to him or her? Well, I would say that uh, Toy Story 2, Shrek, or Monsters, Inc., or Finding Nemo would be good uh, next uh, movies to watch. But how would we do this automatically? A very common method is to look at essentially the co-occurrence counts in in the data. So for Toy Story, you would just be looking at, you know, how many times does Toy Story co-occur in a session with another movie I, and then divide that by the total number of times Toy Story occurs in sessions, and that is uh, your, your um, co-occurrence count, or the conditional probability actually, or the, to be more precise, the maximum likelihood estimate for the conditional probability of um, I uh, occurring uh, in a session given that uh, Toy Story occurred. All right, so what happens if we do that? Well, here is uh, what it looks like in the movie lens 25 million data set, where I uh, retrieved essentially the top 10 recommendations based on their co-occurrence probability for Toy Story. And what you see is that uh, none of the top 10 movies actually is an animated movie, which is something that you would expect uh, from a recommender, I would argue. Um, and it actually turns out um, that if you plot the popularity rank of these movies, that all of the 10 top 10 recommendations are also among the top 25 most popular movies in the data set. So, in the language of causal inference, uh, this is uh, called confounding. So popularity confounds the true similarity that you want to estimate. Now, I would like to, uh, to formalize this a little bit better. So here's uh, uh, the type of model that we assume. Given a set of, uh, we are given a set of session vectors SK, and SK is a binary vector indicating which items occurred in a session. Note that session here refers to a, you know, uh, defined to an interesting context, which is defined by um, the the designer of the the algorithm. It can be in user's entire history, which will be the case for the examples that I'll show here. So, for example, in um, the session vector below, um, the use or in that session, items one, four, six, and seven uh, occurred. Now, what we want uh, is an estimator for the conditional probability of an item uh, occurring given another item, let's say to Toy Story. And um, the problem is though that it is unrealistic to, to assume that we observe this full vector SK 
users are typically not equally aware of all items or their interface uh, biases, which um, will will cause uh, some of these uh, um, entries to be not observed. So what we get is this uh, partial version of SK, SK OBS, where some of the entries are missing, not at random. And uh, I've circled here two entries that were uh, that are missing. The problem is that if we use the estimator you saw earlier, this naive estimator is uh, that this maximum likelihood estimator is not consistent. So how do we fix this? Well, one solution um, that has been used a lot uh, in counterfactual uh, learning is um, the, the well-known inverse propensity scoring estimator where we essentially multiply the observed, um, well, in, in this specific scenario, it amounts to multiplying the observed counts by the inverse propensities, if you assume an item-based propensity model. So here would just um, essentially PI and PJ is the probability that an item I or J um, is, is observed. So now all is well. No, well, we need, still need to get the propensities. And where do we get these from? Well, randomization is one way of obtaining those, but often infeasible in practice because you can't expose users to just um, any random item. And uh, the, sec or the second approach uh, uh, is to perhaps fit a propensity model on observational data, but this relies on strong, unverifiable assumptions. So what we do uh, did in this work is we proposed like a third um, way of obtaining these uh, propensities and um, we rely on, we, we kind of start with the question of what if we had some labeled data? In particular, what if we had pairwise preference statements uh, like saying that the movie Up, given Toy Story, is more relevant uh, than the movie Star Wars, given Toy Story? And now what we did is we uh, used this uh, labeled data and connected to the true probabilities, conditional probabilities that we want to estimate uh, by saying that, well, the true probability of up occurring in a session should also be uh, larger than Star Wars uh, occurring in a session, given that Toy Story was also uh, in that session. And um, essentially, what we then do is plug in the IPS estimator for that true probability. And this is possible because it is consistent. And then you can, uh, then this becomes kind of an optimization problem where now we uh, find a propensity model which satisfies these constraints. So to summarize, this is the high level picture of uh, our framework. So input is kind of a propensity model P theta. Um, uh, the observational data, in our case, that was uh, the, the co-occurrence counts. And then you have to annotate a data where you get these preference uh, or, or statements. Um, and um, you feed that into this uh, ranking objective and that estimates the propensities. And then these propensities can be used in downstream tasks, for example, in matrix factorization, or in our paper, we only used it to do the simple uh, current cur uh, estimation correction. So now on to the um, empirical results. Um, we use the uh, MovieLens 25 million data set in a binarized version, kind of uh, thresholding at three. Um, and then for the annotated data, and I think that is the interesting bit here, we um, found this really uh, interesting data set by Yao and Harper, where they asked MovieLens, actual MovieLens users, to uh, rate movies based on how similar they are to a given uh, movie. That, that given movie is called Seed Movie. And so then what we had is, is 67 rankings after filtering where one ranking would start with a movie like Toy Story and then people would annotate which other movies are similar. And so we had about 10 relevant candidates per seat ranking. And then we would sample negatives to create relevance pairs. So we would say that uh, a, a rated movie um, given a seat movie J is more relevant than a random sample uh, given J. And for the propensity model, we used an attribute-based propensity model. Again, more details are in the paper where we use the release day, the popularity, and the ratio of ratings with respect to the seat movie. Okay, so 
for the metrics, uh, we used uh, recall at K with a higher value of K to be robust to missing movies because not even in the annotated data set, not, not all movies were annotated. And uh, we also used the mean ranks of relevant items to uh, measure how deep you would have to go on average to find all uh, relevant items in the, in the uh, target test set. For the baselines, we considered a wide, uh, wide variety of, of common methods, uh, popularity, uh, random. I think those are self-explanatory. Then supervised uh, was a method where you learned the relevance label directly based on um, the, the small annotated data. And then we also had some matrix factorization-based methods, such as uh, SVD, uh, weighted regularized matrix factorization based uh, Bayesian personalized ranking, and uh, sparse linear um, models. And um, we trained them on a training set, then uh, picked their best hyperparameters on a validation set, separate validation set, and then um, only evaluated them once on the test set, on the final test set. So next are the test set uh, results. Um, what you can see here is that our method performs best in terms of recall and mean ranks. Um, the second best performing method in terms of recall is slim. However, it misses out on some relevant items. And Corker, which is kind of the naive estimator that you saw earlier, actually doesn't perform uh, well at all. And that is because of the bias more qualitatively, you can see that when compared to other methods, ours, um, I would say, um, like retrieves uh, more relevant candidates, especially even IDMK um still retrieves uh, popular movies that are not relevant, like Back to the Future or Star Wars 4 uh, when being queried for Toy Story. A few um, things to consider uh, or a few words about how to pick a propensity model. So the two things you want to trade off is the statistical, uh, statistical efficiency versus the causal validity of a model. For example, in this given simplified causal graph, there are two causally valid propensity models. The first option is a model uh, which conditions in all variables on the top. The second option is uh, to simply learn the salient score here, the bottom kind of node for each item. What, with a large inventory site, the second model where you learn a salient score might lack statistical efficiency. However, in case of uh, in any of the top row variables are unobserved, this model would still remain costly valid. So these are some considerations. Overall, um, today we presented a method that estimates causal parameters via like a small annotated data set, and it makes an assumption. And by making an assumption about the relationship of the true causal effects and annotations, we applied it to item to item recommendation, where we formalized it as an estimation uh, problem from uh, missing data and leverage the IPS estimator. And in future work, uh, it'd be interesting to look at learning guarantees and under which um, 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 specific circumstances we can identify the parameters, the true parameters, and uh, also to apply to other scenarios where annotation is easy, for example, search. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. I don't see any questions at the moment on Huwa. Uh, wait a couple more minutes for that. But maybe you can uh, uh, explain one thing. Uh, you may have mentioned it and I missed it. But uh, mm -hmm. is there a threshold on the, the number of items that you need to annotate for this thing to work? I mean, yeah, so there's a plot in the um, paper that actually examines how data efficient it is, or the sample complexity. and in, in this scenario, um, in, the, in, in the movie lens uh, data uh, set, um, about 200 uh, annotated examples are already enough um, to reach uh, almost full performance. Um, but again, I think I also answered that question earlier um, on WUVA. It depends on um, also the, the statistical, remember when I talked about the statistical efficiency of a propensity model? If your propensity model is more complex, you might need more samples to estimate the parameters of the propensity model. So this is kind of a trade-off that you need to make um, as, a, as a practitioner or a designer working uh, on these systems. In this paper, I've used essentially the model where I, an attribute-based um, um, propensity model where I condition on 
um, the upper row um, as as uh, um, confounders. I hope that is sufficiently yep. clear. Thank you. Uh, there is a question um, which I'll read. Is there is there bias within the labeling data where a user might label a movie just by the name or poster of the movie which he or she haven't hasn't seen? That is, I think, uh, a very good question, and I think there. I, I would argue it's easier to control for these things when you have um, these small annotated data sets. And the way that the data set that I used was created was essentially by sampling as well. And so that kind of controlled for some of these biases. And um, the second bit to add is that the objective where you kind of tie these preference statements to the propensity seems to be robust on its own. So even though you might have some biases or some missing data, because I only use not the, the direct labels like um, to, to impute kind of um, um, relevant scores, but rather the ordering, um, it's more it's more robust uh, because I don't make inference statements. Like it's it's essentially the same idea that the BPR uh, uses um, by saying that we're treating um, the observed and uh, as statements as kind of implicit preferences. Um, yeah, so you're kind of using that like a learning to rank, rank kind of a. Approach. Yes, exactly, and that, but that only to estimate the propensities, and then you could use it downstream to do other things. But um, yeah. One last quick question: um, You mentioned that uh, you defined the idea of a session. Mm -hmm. So, what would this session be? I mean, in some contexts, like let's say market basket. You know, a session might be uh, defined as like one transaction or something like that. But what, in a movie-less context, what would be a session? Right. I I would. Um, I think yeah, that's a very good question. And here, session is something that um, essentially depends on the application that you want to power with recommendations. So, as you said, in some scenarios, in in terms of if you want to do item to item recommendation for basket completion then a session would be essentially your shopping basket, right? If in the movie lens scenario, I think it is reasonable to assume that session comprises the entire uh, user history. Um, another definition could be to say everything that a user rated in the last year to you know, make, make temporally or make lo more local kind of recommendations. So it is something that you can control as a designer um, and you decide like how local versus global um, recommendations should be. Okay. Cool. Thank, thank you very much. Um, yeah. We are out of okay. time, but uh, let me actually, you brought out a good point, uh, Tobias. The, uh, these, these papers were pre presented in an earlier session. So I think you can on HUA actually access the earlier sessions uh, a record of the questions and answers, basically. So if uh, the audience is interested in additional uh, questions and your answers on some of those questions, they can also look at the, the, the previous session on HUA. All right, uh, thank you very much for attending these sessions and I hope that uh, you will enjoy the rest of the conference.